they're selling 420 paper representations of a single ounce of silver for a single ounce of silver. And so there's 420 claims to that single ounce of silver when they do that. That's how they suppress, well, that's one of the many ways that they suppress the price of silver. It's hard for us to believe that in the United States, pre-1964, we had silver in our money because now we're moving towards a situation where we may not even have cash any longer. So much is happening. So much has changed since our founding fathers wrote into the United States Constitution that silver and gold are real money. Today, we're joined by our special guest, Mr. Pat Holland from the Missouri Freedom Initiative. He knows a lot about the history of silver, but he has some keen ideas on where we might be heading. He's going to share all that and a lot more with us today. Pat, welcome to Ron's Basement. Hey, Ron. Thank you so much for having me back. And I'm looking at, uh, at the gold bear here. He's got a blindfold off. Look at that. <laughs> yes, we, we did it. The you know, mission yep. accomplished, $2,500 gold. And as we're recording this on the morning of August 29th, 2024, we still have gold above $2,500. You and I knew it would happen. Silver's doing pretty well also, you know, fighting to get above $30 per ounce. But Pat, you know, on the subject of, of, of let's say, uh, what a constitutional or junk silver or 90% silver, anything pre-1964, it's almost hard to believe that, that you know, 50-ish years ago, we actually had silver in our money. And to think about where we're heading next is, uh, is an interesting concept. Do you have any thoughts on that matter? Well, constitutional silver is rare. They stopped making it a long time ago. So whatever's still in the system is all they have left. So it strikes me as normal that that would uh, become uh, harder to get or harder to find, harder for even uh, the stores to pure, uh, procure. So that actually makes sense to me. And I have a lot of friends. Uh, well, actually, I don't want to say it's like hundreds of friends, but I have maybe a dozen friends, all they collect is junk silver. They don't get bullion. They don't get uh, numismatic beyond, you know, basically what you would find in junk silver, like Morgans and stuff like that, freedom dollars. So that actually makes sense to me that when there's stress in the silver market, that constitutional silver is harder and harder to find. Yeah, I'm getting reports from Coin Shop Chris, from a number of different people, that while the overall silver bullion market, you know, 10 ounce bars, five ounce bars, uh, a lot of the sovereign coins are are, are still readily available that I won't call it a shortage in constitutional silver, but definitely what I would qualify as stress in that market. You bring up a great point, right? Like they don't make it anymore. And, um, and, and a lot of it was actually, from what I understand, melted down around that 1980 timeframe when we had silver hit $50 per ounce, which in today's money, uh, is well north of $150 when you when you uh, when you adjust that for inflation. So it would make sense that this stuff is rare and uh, uh, somewhat ironic that it's referred to oftentimes as being quote unquote junk. <laughs> I like the term junk silver. I've that's yeah. never offended me. Okay. I like that. Uh, <laughs> and it's junk, by the way, folks, because it's 90. percent It's yeah. not even 92.5, which is sterling. Uh, so at any rate, uh, the term junk silver, I, I, it's near and dear to my heart. I love it. Yeah. One man, one man's junk is every man's treasure or should be anyway. I think that you and I would agree that this, this might be, uh, more, more readily qualified as junk. Mm -hmm. Is it, are, are we moving? I mean, it just blows my mind to think that we could be moving right now from a, from a system that, that yes, we did have 90% silver in our coinage, not that mm -hmm. long ago to a pure electronic system. We have these Fed now proposite. We have all these different, you know, CBDCs on the horizon. What do you see? What's your experience with what's going on out there, Pat, from your, from your level? You bet. And first of all, let's, let's just talk a little bit about Fed now, which started July of 2023. And it does many, many, many things. But one of the things it does do is actually, in, in fact, this is the end product. A Fed now is to go to a cashless society, and they do this by incentivizing businesses to stop dealing in cash. Now, the incentives, I don't know what they are. It's different per customer, per bank. But I just, as you know, Ron, I just spent a lot of time up in Minnesota. 
-hmm. while I was up there, uh, my, my oldest brother, Darren had a birthday and we decided to go to the Minnesota twins game, which is his favorite thing to do in the world. So of course we're doing this on his birthday. What I noticed, this is the first time I've gone to a twins game, I think in 17 years. First of all, they don't have the Metrodome anymore. They have what's called the Target Center. And one thing uh, I got to tell you guys is you can't get twins tickets with cash. Nor can you go into the Target Center and actually buy anything from vendors, any food, any drinks, any, uh, you know, I, I don't know what you want to call them, souvenirs or jerseys or hats or anything. And they sell everything in there. None of that can be purchased with cash either. You must use a credit or a debit card to transact in the sports stadium known as the Target Center. Now, when I was talking to other family members, they said, well, it's been that way for a long time. You know, this is the way it is in all the sports centers now. It's been that way since last year. I didn't know. Uh, but I'm kind of curious, you know, basically for people in the comments section who are watching this video, if you've noticed places where you live where you can't use cash anymore, I have. Okay, Ron. Can I can I leave a comment in the comment section? Sure, of course yeah, you can. I, I, I've I've been a Six Flags season pass holder for probably the last eight years, and last year at the Six Flags in St. Louis, and I just visited the one in Chicago about a month ago. You cannot use cash. Everything is on credit card. Everything is on credit card. Um, so it is happening. And you know, the other thing I want to throw in, Pat, you talked about the incentives that they may be giving business to move away from cash. Maybe there's not incentives per se that they're giving them. Maybe they are uh, de-incentive. I can't even say the word. Maybe they're discouraging them from working in cash by making it more difficult because you hear stories about that all the time, coin shop owners or other businesses that are having problems with their banks as related to, uh, doing big cash transactions. So could mm -hmm. they be incentivizing it sure. by making it more difficult, I guess. Would sure. Be yeah. And another great way of looking at it, you talked about de-incentivizing. How about if they charge them 2% for a yeah. deposit that yeah. includes cash versus, you know, no deposit because everything's electronic. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so there's absolutely no uh, work needed. It's all computers actually handling all these transactions now at this point. Now with cash, you have to involve people. People have to count the cash on both sides of the transaction. And for the banks to be saying, well, gosh darn it, we just don't have the manpower to do that. That's ridiculous. Counting cash, mm -hmm. you know, is very easy to do. But there's a lot to be said for anonymous transactions, Ron. A lot. And if you can't make anonymous transactions anymore, boy, howdy, are you in for a shock because you're going to be taxed for every single transaction you do. Yeah. Remember the it, story it, I like it, to tell about the wheelbarrow? Go ahead, Ron. And, and if you're a businessman that is dealing with large amounts of cash and you go to your bank with uh, $100,000 in cash that you want to deposit and the bank mm -hmm. says, well, sure, you can do that, but there's a 2% charge. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a lot of money, right? Yep. That That's a big uh, incentive not to deal with cash and to move to this pure electronic system uh, that by its very nature is very trackable. Sure. And that's another thing with all the traveling I've been doing recently. I've been seeing all the the signs, the neon signs along the, you know, 35 highway and, and uh, 71 highway. And the flash two, uh, actually two prices for diesel because I was driving a diesel truck. One is for cash. The other one is for credit. Mm -hmm. And the one for cash is generally somewhere between five and 10 cents lower right. per gallon. So in that way, the gas stations are incentivizing people to use cash. Take yeah. advantage of that, folks. Take advantage of that. Keep using cash when you buy your gasoline so that, you know, basically these places, these convenience stores, these gas stations don't fall for the Fed now trap. Mm -hmm. If they can still keep dealing in cash, you know, basically then we can still keep cash around. So it's upon all of us to keep some cash with us at all times and try to transact in it. And I'm a solar and gold guy, but I'll tell you what, though, going cashless does not involve silver and gold. It involves tyranny. You don't have that at, at this level with cash at this point. But remember, uh, silver and gold can be dealt with electronically as well. So, you know, basically there is a way to do that. But guys, I'm telling you, I'm at the FedNow program is behind this push to go cashless across the United States. 
And I've been called a conspiracy theorist by legislators up in uh, Jefferson City, Missouri, because I'm talking about this FedNow program. I've read the documentation online. I know what's coming. I know why they're doing it. And it's specifically to turn us into a cashless society. So it's easier to transition to a central bank digital currency. And, you know, Pat, for the for the people out there that think, oh, that'll never happen. We'll never get rid of cash. Right. Mm -hmm. That never happened. Right. I remember when the McDonald's by my house, it was probably 15 years ago or so, started taking credit cards. Mm -hmm. And I thought, this is the weirdest thing. Who would ever buy McDonald's on? Because back then it was like a foreign concept. Who would ever mm -hmm. buy McDonald's on a credit card? Right. Um, I just thought it was the uh, like a foreign idea that would never catch on. And you know what? 15 years later, uh, I'll be honest, most of the time when I go to McDonald's now, I pay for it on my credit card. I pay my credit cards off every month. But just for so this idea that we could move away from cash uh, in, in, in as you've you know, with your your example of the Twins game and, it's, and the Six Flags, there's a lot of other places that just aren't taking cash anymore. It can really happen. Mm -hmm. um, I know you want to talk more about the Fed now program. And I, and I, and I want to say one thing about that and get your opinion on this. And then mm -hmm. I will keep my mouth closed. The way I look at the Fed now program is it's the infrastructure for the, for the mm -hmm. electronic system to come. And I think the best analogy I can use is if you're a person out there watching, joining us right now, that likes to use cash, that likes to maybe stack silver and gold, it would be like if you had a little house on the outskirts of a city and you had dug your own water well and you have no problem with the water that, that you're able to get from your well, it works perfectly, all that. And suddenly there's uh, trucks coming through, laying a big water main pipe right through your yard and they're using eminent domain and you go to them and you say, hey, what are you doing? And they said, well, we're just we're just laying this pipe. We're, we're putting in a new water main through here. Uh, and, and then, you know, a year later, you get a letter from the, from the local city saying you are required to hook onto this water, water main. That's I, right. I, I see the, I see the fed now is kind of that, that, that pipe that's been laid, uh, which, uh, enables this whole electronic system to come, to come about. Yeah. That's a great analogy because actually that kind of thing is happening around the entire United States and small towns. Mm -hmm. where they're being required to go on city water, uh, city sewer, get off their septic, get off their well. Yeah. Uh, so I, actually, I couldn't have come up with a better analogy, but that is it, gang. The FedNow program literally was designed to literally slowly sip the cash out of the system by literally making it so businesses are incentivized or decentivized, you know, basically around credit and cash. And you know, I, I feel like I'm kind of belaboring the point, but I promise you that's what the Fed no program is all about. And as we find more and more places that are not taking cash anymore, I would, if I were in a position to do so while I was at the Twins game, is try and find out and get to the bottom of why they made that decision and actually start talking to people. So if you have a local business that is saying, oh, we're looking at not taking cash anymore, ask them why. Talk to them about it. <clears throat> You know, if, especially if it's a mom and pop place, if it's a convenience store, you know, it might be a corporate, you know, decision. So you might not get very far with that. But but yeah. but I think people need to weigh in on this rather than just accepting, you know, and, and saying, oh, geez, well, I'm just starting to use credit card for everything. now. I, I know I have never done that and neither has my wife. We always carry cash. Uh, so we may not have enough cash for what we're doing. Uh, and then we'll use a credit card, but we still use cash. Like for instance, you mentioned, you know, going to a Wendy's or whatever like that. Mm -hmm. I'll use cash. I don't use the card yeah. uh, unless I'm completely out of cash. Yeah. And this is very, very important for all of us to remember. It is up to us to decide what we're going to use as money in the United States. People yeah. may say, no, it's up to the government. It's up to the federal reserve. No, it is not. It's up to us. Businesses have a choice too. So, I mean, let's, uh, you know, keep, you know, visiting businesses that accept cash and, and the ones that have stopped taking cash, I'm not saying to stop visiting them, question them, ask them why they're doing it. 
If you're looking to buy gold, silver, or platinum, do yourself a favor and check out Pimbex, the online precious metals bullion dealer and sponsor of Ron's Basement. I was a happy customer before they offered to support the channel. You'll find they have the best prices, quality, and service. I think Pimbex is best, and you will too. And be sure to tell them that you're from Ron's basement. When you think about the spectrum of what money is right now, and you start with silver and gold, right? Real money, uh, mm -hmm. constitutional, all that good stuff. And then you go to the other end of the spectrum, which would be pure electronic, uh, CBDC, all that. And then the middle there is cash somewhere, probably, you know, a little bit closer to electronic. But do you think that if they get rid of cash, like we talked about, at that point, that really leaves two options. I mean, could that be in a in almost a paradoxical way, a, a potential catalyst for more people realizing that, hey, if I want something physical, uh, maybe they used to, you know, think of cash as being something physical. But if I want anything physical, anything real, my only option left at this point is silver and gold. Could it actually be a catalyst possibly for more people coming into the silver and gold movement? Absolutely, it will be. And in fact, I'd like to speak to that a little bit because, you know, as uh, I'm a state legislative guy. And there's two states, and I'll probably get the names of the states wrong, gang, and you'll have to forgive me. I've kind of been away for a month or so. Uh, but I think it's New Jersey and Nebraska. Both states actually got silver and gold legislation done in their states, but uh, were vetoed by their governor. Gone back to the General Assembly where they overrode the veto in both states, but in both states, the governor still refused to sign, you know, gold and silver as legal tender or elimination of states capital gains taxes on gold and silver. So this is happening right now. What are the forces behind this? Why are the governor saying, I just don't give a rat's butt what the people think. I don't care what my General Assembly thinks. I think they're probably being incentivized to say no to that, the governor. And they've not been able to pay off the entire General Assembly to stop it from happening. But what I'm saying is there is resistance uh, to gold and silver legislation all over the United States and in different ways. We dealt with that in Missouri with you know, our House Speaker, Dean Plocker. He simply wouldn't let it happen. We couldn't even get it to the governor. We did have a rumor that the governor would veto it if we got it to him. But um, but at any rate, it is what it is. Mm -hmm. uh, the resistance is there. So to your point, I think uh, the people are getting angry. They're getting upset. They want the option for gold and silver. And I think when they find that there's only one or two people behind stopping it from happening, you have to assume the banks are somehow involved with these people that are stopping gold and silver legislation. But I think the very fact that we had 27 states with gold and silver legislation last year, I think that uh, kind of answers your question. The yeah. people want it. Yeah. They actually want it. They, it, it. Let's put it another way, Ron. They want the option. Yeah. And, and that makes sense since we don't have a central bank digital currency yet. Right. You know, simply because we don't have it here yet. But folks in Australia and Canada, look out. You guys are going to be getting it within a year. Yeah. Yeah. I know there's, it seems like Australia is uh, leading the pack, unfortunately. As you're talking about the situation right now, it reminds me of when I, when I dive into the history of our country, uh, the book, The Wizard of Oz, right? There was mm -hmm. this, there, it, it, the bankers, and at the time, I believe it was the, uh, uh, the big bankers in London that were pushing the United States to go away from using silver in the money. And, and at that point, it was to just be on the gold standard, as I understand it. Uh, but there was all this, and there's memos that I've read online, these, these memos between London and New York, and uh, this real a devious strategy to, uh, to, to, to de-incentivize de de uh, uh, the this, this silver back system. And it just it feels a lot like what's going on now is this move to go completely electronic. Mm -hmm. um, and and uh and 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 that there may be some things going on uh like you said right who who would be opposed to this why are these governors vetoing this legislation when it's something that benefits the people and and that the people want and it's totally constitutional yeah yeah i mean there there is not a constitutional argument against gold and silver what i'm hearing the arguments i hear it's too expensive 
too expensive for us to take gold and silver. No, it's not. Yeah. Um, so, and there's lots of ways to do it. Uh, another thing I hear is um, uh, there's no storage uh, space or facility for our state to be collecting gold and silver. Yeah. You know, that's the thing. Texas got it right back in 2015 when they passed their legislation. Uh, they're virtually hoarding gold and silver now. And states are wanting to partake in that action because Texas is talking about coming up with a digital way of transferring gold and silver. And if everyone's working through a central bank like Texas's depository, then actually we could put up a secondary system. I would much rather see Missouri have its own rather than joining Texas. And in fact, I'll fight for that and I'll try and make that happen. But right now with the treasurer we have in the state of Missouri, we'll never get a depository. He is totally 100% against it. So states uh, are starting to, and by the way, there was, I think, if I remember right, six or seven states that were trying to get depositories in 2024. Wow. No kidding, folks. I mean, that's how big this is. Um, they're looking for a way out of the Federal Reserve system. They know what the FedNow program is about, and they're very, very frightened that the Okay, I'm sorry. Let me back up a second here. This is actually a good point. Okay, so if we go to a central bank digital currency, I'll have a digital wallet. Ron will have a digital wallet. You know, all of you out there will get a digital wallet. Whether you want it or not, you're going to have to have one. Whether or not you use it is irrelevant for this example. But what folks have to remember is the state of Missouri will also get a digital wallet from the Fed. Uh -huh. And if they don't behave, they can start uh, freezing funds in the state of Missouri, freezing Missouri's funds altogether, even though this, the funds may come from the state as opposed to the federal government. The state itself will become a slave to whoever controls the digital currency. And if you're not doing the right thing in your state, if your legislation is just a little too much about freedom and liberty, you know, they may shut down the wallet. So this is something people have to remember. States know this. They're, generally, they're not very stupid. I'm sure that California, by the way, California, I tried and I tried and I tried to get legislation in California. No one will carry it. They said it'll never get done. It'll never happen. I'm not going to expend the energy. Wow. So states like California, Illinois, maybe New York, you know, the real, Minnesota, by the way, is a very blue state. Um, it looks like the blue states are less interested in the depository part of it. But blue states want out of sales taxes on gold and silver. They are working towards that. Uh, so they do want a certain amount of freedom, but they don't want to replace the Federal Reserve. So, and I'm just talking about blue states. And and by the way, I'm not talking about the people. I'm talking about the legislatures and maybe the governors. Yeah, yeah. It's going to be interesting to see the next five to ten years how this whole situation develops as we, you know, and on one end move toward a electronic, purely electronic, uh, monetary system, and then on the other side we do have a powerful force of people who are pro precious metals, pro silver and gold. And like you said, we have the constitution on our side as well. So mm -hmm. I think it sets up for um, if there's a silver lining to the, to the, to the black cloud of getting rid of cash, I think it does set up this potential uh, catalyst for a confrontation confrontation between you know, uh, silver and gold versus pure electronic money and could bring a lot more interest into the precious metals. I just, I, you know, I think it, I think it could in some strange way possibly be a good thing for, for the, for the worlds of silver and gold. And in regards to that, you were talking about the infrastructure being laid down. You were talking about the, the pipes that were being laid down next to the houses. And then later they're, you know, forced, you know, to take water exactly. from the city. Well, in the same way, the free market has actually been laying the groundwork and the infrastructure for all kinds of different transac uh, uh, transactional capability with gold and silver. Yeah, everything from gold backs, you know, to you know UPMA with their debit card, mm -hmm. and I think other banks are doing that as well. Uh, so you can do it electronically, you can do it with coins, you can do it with gold backs. So all the options are still available, uh, even on the gold and silver side. Yeah. So. This is where depositories or billion banks are becoming an extremely important uh, part of this equation here. The yeah. free market must, must be allowed to operate within this gold and silver venue. We cannot have the government taking over gold and silver. 
Yeah, and there's Kinesis. Um, Kinesis, yeah. I think yep. there's one called Load. Yes. Um, that's an interesting concept because uh, uh, because there are the, the of the free market moving into this area, right? Being able to, I think our friend Daniel Diaz from Citizens for Sound Money right. likes to talk about making silver and gold functional. He was the mm -hmm. first person that I heard say that. Um, uh, and that and that the free market is is kind of seeping into that arena. But just my opinion, I've yet to, I think there's great op, uh, products out there, great uh, systems that are being built, but I've yet to feel like any of them has, 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 they're, they're growing, but it seems like one of them is going to have to get some real traction at some point, like mm -hmm. real solid traction. Uh, but that's just part of this process, right? Of, yep. of, as we, as we kind of work our way through it. I do know also, interestingly, that the World Gold Council, is working with the LBMA, our good friends at the London Bullion Market Association, to also build an electronic blockchain-based uh, system as well. And, you know, look, I don't like the LBMA, and I don't really have a big opinion on the World Gold Council one way or the other, but uh, those are two big-name organizations that are also involved in, uh, you know, high-level organizations that are also involved in what you're talking about, right? Sure. So the free market's moving in. Yep. Fortuna Mining is a global intermediate gold and silver producer. Since 2005, Fortuna's best-in-class management has delivered impressive growth and profits. Fortuna's solid financial position and operational expertise allows for performance in any precious metals price cycle, but also provides a foundation from which to harvest robust profits in more favorable metals markets. Investing in Fortuna is an investment in quality, long-term, sustainable production of in-demand precious and base metals. And we have to, that's why I said we have to be very careful about that aspect of things. LBMA, uh, although it's, uh, you know, quasi-private, mm -hmm. uh, but they do involve themselves in setting the price of gold and silver with Blackwater. Yeah. And so mm -hmm. when you're talking about a blockchain, um, with someone like the LBMA or even the COMEX. Remember now, the, the leverage is huge on silver. And in fact, I saw it a couple of weeks ago. I think it was 420 to 1. Mm -hmm. Now, we're talking about the futures market, folks, when we're talking about this kind of leverage. In other words, uh, they're selling 420 paper representations of a single ounce of silver for a single ounce of silver. And so there's 420 claims to that single ounce of silver when they do that. That's how they suppress. Well, that's one of the many ways that they suppress the price of silver. And if you look at the U.S. debt clock, you can confirm, you know, what I just told you. What you can also confirm is they're not going after gold anywhere near as hard as they're going after silver. There's something about this. You know, they silver is the Achilles heel of the entire system for because of its usefulness in industry. That's why. And, and also. Uh, it's getting used up so rapidly, it's becoming rarer. And at some point, the rarity of silver um, might match the rarity of gold above ground. Now, I'm, I'm not 100%. Some people say it, we're it's there. Less. It's less. I, some okay. people claim there's less above ground silver yep. than there is gold. Yep. That's what so, I've heard lately. So when they're selling futures and they keep pushing down the price of futures, they're not taking into account the inflation that the mining companies are going through on fuel and manpower to get the silver out of the ground. And so this is a very, very dangerous game they're playing right now. And we have seen before where mining companies have literally boarded up some of their mines because they literally could not afford to mine it for the uh, price that was set by the LBMA for the price of silver. We have seen that in South America before in the past. I'm not sure we've seen it in anywhere else but in south america we definitely saw that and i do believe a, a few places in canada uh boarded up for about a year when the price of silver went really low they couldn't afford to mine it anymore at current prices and once again the, these are not free market prices gang these prices are set by the lbma and by blackrock that's how they do it and they literally determine how much silver is worth you know by literally pulling a number out of the air gold is harder for them to manipulate on that level but uh, but they do control gold to a certain extent as well. But rich people tend to actually invest in gold rather than silver. And that's when they want physical.
by the way. When they when they just want paper, they'll do both. So they don't want to piss off the rich people. These are the people who are, you know, uh, you know, contributing to political campaigns. They don't want to piss them off. <clears throat> so gold is not manipulated as badly as silver is. Yeah. And, you know, there's there's few things in life that we know for sure. But when it comes to silver, we do know for sure that the world is demanding on an annual basis more silver than the mining companies can produce. Mm -hmm. We also know that the mining companies are producing a smaller amount less silver every year. It's not dramatic, but they are producing less and less silver every year. So the world demands more silver than the miners can produce. And we also know for sure that we don't know what the exact amount is, but there is just a finite amount of silver um, that's in the surplus fund that's being drawn upon now for the last four years. Uh, so we know that eventually at some point, if these trends continue and if the demand for silver continues to increase, we will run out of silver um, at some point, right? Nobody knows for sure. sure the exact date of when it is, but if these current trends continue where we have a decrease in production and increase in demand and this above ground, I call it the silver slush fund that they draw upon every year is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. At some point, we have a silver shortage. First Mining Gold is a development company advancing two of the largest gold projects in Canada, Spring Pole in Ontario and Du Parquet located in Quebec. Each already has 5 million ounces of gold reserves, but exploration initiatives are underway at both projects to find even more gold. First Mining is well financed, has zero debt, and owns an interest in four additional Canadian gold development projects. Actually, technically, I think we technically I think we do have a silver shortage already. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, peak silver, forgive me, uh, I think that mm -hmm. was 2015. And that was uh, the 2015 was the last year they were able to maintain those big numbers. And that was after high grading after 2009, 2010. Yeah. Um, and, and by the way, when silver went up in 2011, I'm not sure that had anything to do with the rarity of it or anything to do with getting it out of the earth. I think that had to do with the euro looking like it was failing the pigs, yeah. nation, if you remember, because Bitcoin went up at the same time. And, and I think that was correlated. Mm -hmm. However, I will say that I do believe that uh, basically the high grading is, uh, you know, just about done now. They're going to have to start low grading and leaching mines uh, to get every last bit of silver out of them. And I don't think they're developing a lot of silver mines anymore. We're going to probably end up having to go into the ocean to get silver probably within the next 10, 15 years. We, we, we could be moving into a golden age for silver, Pat, because you're exactly right. There are very few companies that are exploring <clears throat> or developing new silver mines. So if if this all comes to fruition and we do, you know, the the, the price, uh, the, uh, the actual price discovery is based upon the physical market. We do get a, 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 a big increase in the silver price. There, there's no pipeline. It's not like there's a switch they can turn on and say, well, now we can make twice as much silver. I mean, there's some small modifications, but... It's going to be a, I like to say, a six to 12 year gap mm -hmm. for the mining industry to even start to catch up. And if the demand continues to go up, because it takes, you know, if you're going to explore for silver, you don't know you're, that you're going to find it. It takes millions and millions of dollars to just do the drilling. You don't know for sure that you're going to find silver. If you do find it, then you have to go through a, a, a multi-year permitting process. Then you have mm -hmm. to go through a multi-year process of building the mine. And then you got to hope that the mine actually produces what you thought it would produce based upon. So there could be a big gap, um, you know, where, where the silver uh, uh, price is, is forced to go much higher just to, to compensate for uh, the fact that, that the supply will be significantly lower than demand. Potentially. Don't make any financial decisions based on anything. Yeah, but that's that's actually technically that would be the free market forces beginning yeah. to assert itself back into the silver <clears throat> arena. And, you know, for silver miners, God love them. I mean, they put up with a lot of crap and we all know yeah. this. I mean, Ron, you talk to them. You know what yeah. you know, I'm talking about. But the fact of the matter is, at some point, there should be a little solidarity between them like you and me with our red shirts today. Right. And they should stop producing so much silver. 
um, until they raise the prices to uh, to a livable wage for those who work in these companies. So these companies can make a little bit of money. The gold companies are doing quite well, folks. Yeah. But uh, silver, those who are just involved in silver are not doing so well. And those that have silver as a byproduct, you know, are actually making out like bandits because they are bringing up stuff like copper is worth a lot right now. Mm -hmm. You know, we've not even talked about copper, but um, but gold and copper and possibly zinc are probably the primary ones that bring up silver as a secondary product. And these guys are, you know, doing very well on their other metals. That's how they're able to keep suppressing the price of silver because these guys produce, I think it's 70 percent of the world's silver. Mm -hmm. you know, second, secondary mining. And uh, so in other words, what that means is they're not digging in the earth to bring out silver, but they are taking it out along with whatever their primary metal is that they're trying to, you know, extrude, you know, in this case, gold or copper, uh, gold and silver mines are always bringing up silver. It seems like, and yeah. in some cases, zinc mines. And zinc, yeah. Zinc, lead, copper from the base metal perspective. But what's even a little more interesting, uh, before I keep you on this for, t for too long, Pat, but what's even more interesting is that I heard Ross Beatty and I've heard other people say this as well. The co copper, the new copper mines are much deeper. Copper is also becoming increasingly difficult to find. That's so right. It used to be that the easy copper, the, the easy to mine copper always had a lot of silver that kind of coexisted with it. These newer, deeper mines that they have to build for copper, there's hardly any silver or much less silver that coexists with the copper. So yeah, we can't even maintain a copper standard for a monetary standard in the United States. Right. <laughs> we can't because our pennies are made out of zinc now. It's like 3% copper to give it its color. Yeah. You know, yeah. but uh, so we guys, that's a good point here on on if you're for Ron's basement, folks. The United States is is so bad off financially, we can't even maintain a copper standard in our change for our pennies. Yeah. We can't maintain that anymore. Why? Because the copper is worth more than the pennies worth. That's why. So you know, this is how bad things are getting. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, no you're no, you're point. fine. Because what, like 1984 and earlier pennies, I think, mm -hmm. have are made out of copper. And that's then, right. Yeah, uh, yeah. And that, like the penny, I don't forget what it is, but it's worth more than a penny, from what I understand, because of one point four yeah. cents or something yeah. like that. If the penny were made out of copper now. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. I got to run, Pat. I got to go dig through my change drawer. And that's I'm, right. I'm a copper. I'm a copper stacker. Yeah. Pat, it's always great. When you join us, um, if people want to learn more about you, they go to mofree.org. Is that That's correct? right. Yep. yep. And we're about ready to start writing our silver and gold legislation for Missouri. Uh, we'll be sharing this with other states. We're going to make it real easy. We'll put it on our website. But when we have our legislation ready to go, um, I will definitely let you know, Ron. Okay. So folks uh, all over the United States can just go right to our website, get a copy of, of what's actually going on you know, basically with the legislation and see if they can find someone in their state to run that legislation. And let's, let's top 27 states. I mean, 27, that's huge. Mm -hmm. To have 27 states, <clears throat> pardon me, going for silver and gold legislation simultaneously, yeah. that was massive. I don't think there's, there's ever been anything like that before what happened in 2024. Let's yeah. hit 30. Yeah, 2025. somebody somebody needs to put a map up on the Internet of the United States with each state <laughs> and kind of a you can click on each state and see where they are in the gold and silver movement. I think that'd be a fun thing for, for people to get to check out. I talked to the 10th Amendment Center and it, they're thinking about doing that. Yeah. So, yeah, I think that would be a good idea as well. Yeah. Yeah. We could have silver and gold states and then, you know, the states. I know California wouldn't have much color to it, but yeah, no. hey, <laughs> things sure happen little, little by little. Uh, you know, on behalf of myself, Pat, all the silver and gold stackers across the United States, around the world, you've worked tirelessly. I know here in Missouri, right, right in the, mm -hmm. the center of the United States, but you've also helped out on a national basis on many different levels in many different ways. And, and you do that uh uh, what's the right term? Pro rata. You aren't out there being sponsored or or making no. money off this in any way, shape, or form. So that is correct. Thank you. Okay, and you're loved here in Ron's basement. Uh, you know you're always welcome here, um, and we'll look forward to talking to you next time. All right, Ron. Thank you very much. I appreciate being back, and uh, just want to you know 
actually renew my relationship with that bear right there because that's the first <laughs> time I've seen its eyes. Yeah. So, uh, and that is really cool. But you know what? We got to do something for Smitty. Yeah, we Smitty, the, the silver bear, Smitty here, right above my, there he is, right? yep. $85. And yesterday, Peter Grandage said it's going to take a little while, but it'll it'll happen. So we'll we'll keep an eye on him. Well, there's lots and lots of little things happening in the background that may end up being major worldwide events that may raise silver price, you know, to the point where Smitty will see again. You never know. <laughs> the Brick Nations. You know, That's right. And, and stuff like that. But Ron, it, it's it's been a long time and I'm very, very glad to be back. I was traveling for a while, as you know, but I am back home now. Sounds so it's time for me to get to work on silver and gold legislation. Sounds great, Pat. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. Have a good day.